Okay, well, let's move on then and just talk about the amino acids, amino acid side chains. And we will be, if you won't have to memorize this, uh, these, these structures, uh, we will give you a chart if you have a problem. Uh, on the other hand, you need to get very familiar with them. So they're old friends, even if you can't quite remember how many methylenes were in the chain or something like that. And you will find that they, they fall into certain categories. And I'm just going to try and give you a, an examples of the, the, cat, the, the major uh, categories. There are uh, negatively charged side chains. So ch side chains, an example would be the amino acid known as aspartate or, or asp, in which the side chain, which corresponds to the R1 or to the R2 over there, has a methylene group and then a carboxyl group. But at pH 7-ish, which is the, um, the pH that you find inside a cell, that carboxyl group would be deprotonated, so it would have a negative charge. The other negatively charged amino acid is glutamate, which also, as you'll see, uh, has, a, has a carboxyl group. There are positively charged uh, amino acids. A good one to illustrate this is lysine, in which there's four methylene groups. And then an amino group at the end. However, again at pH 7, uh, the, the kind of pHs you find inside the cell, that amino group is going to get protonated. And so it will have a positive charge on if you have a, a lysine side chain. And arginine, and in most cases histidine, are uh, examples of other amino acids that can have a positively charged group. And while, while, I, while I'm going through all of this, I hope will become apparent in a few minutes. Um, some of the side chains are not positive or negative charged, but rather they're polar. And we just talked about polar bonds at the last time, where you have the more electronegative an atom is, the more greedy it is for electrons. And if you recall, if you have a carbon-carbon bond or a hydrogen-hydrogen bond that's nonpolar and the, the uh, electrons are distributed equally. The oxygen is greedier for electrons, and so there's a little bit of a negative charge there and a little bit of positive charge on the, the hydrogen. Well, that same principle applies to amino acid side chains. You take, for example, the amino acid serine, which has a methylene group and then a hydroxyl group. Well, here we are. There's an OH bond. So there will be a little bit of a negative charge on the oxygen, a little bit of a positive charge on there. There's another um, alcohol called threonine, which also has hydroxyl group. And you can make amides of both aspartate and glutamate to give asparagine and glutamine. And both of these are also polar, too. So what I'm hoping you're beginning to get a sense of, you can do an awful lot with the properties of a peptide chain, just depending on which amino acids you um, dangle off the side. And ultimately, that order of amino acids is what's going to be uh, determined by what's in the gene encoding that uh, protein. Then there are quite a number of amino acid side chains which are hydrophobic. Um, they're sort of fearing, fearing water, if you will. Um, the simplest is alanine, or ala, which is just a methyl group. Or leucine, it's perhaps a little more obvious, because that's This and you can see that that's a, a kind of um, let me just draw it like that. Um, this is very much a kind of uh, structure that's not going to want to interact with with water. 
And then another example would be phenyl alanine or phi. And that one has a methylene group and then a benzene ring. So most of you know have some sense of the properties of benzene, <laughs> a very, very organic uh, solvent. So here you, if you put a side chain like this, it's very much a residue that doesn't want to interact with water any more than benzene wants to interact with water. And then there are um, three special cases. One of these is um, glycine. In this case, it's just a hydrogen. So one of the consequences of that is that since it's just a hydrogen, that's going to be a very, very flexible place in a, if we have a chain of amino acids and there's a glycine there, there's going to be very little in the way of constraints introduced either by steric constraints or by, by interactions. Another very special one is one called cysteine or cis. And it's the same idea as serine. There's a methylene, but instead of having an OH, it has an SH group. And that may not seem to be a great consequence. The sulfur's a little bit larger, but sulfurs have a, the sulfide group here has a, sulfhydro group here has a very special property, and that is it can oxidatively dimerize with another sulfhydro. So if you have a side chain and there's an amino, there's a cysteine that has an SH group and another either part of the same chain or part of a different polypeptide chain that also has the cysteine and they're in an oxidizing environment and they are also close enough together to interact, they can form a bond like this which is known as a is a disulfide bond, and it's the only one of the amino acids that's capable of reaching outside the chain and either hooking to a different part of the chain or to a completely different protein. And in fact, proteins that tend to get excreted out into the media, either back by bacteria or other things, often have a lot of disulfide bonds because when you link the peptide chains together like that, it tends to make a very tough protein that's hard to break down and, and can be very, very robust. And there is one other uh, special uh, category of, uh, uh, one other special amino acid that's known as proline. You have the alpha carbon atom with the carboxyl group. And then there's the amino group here. But um, this carbon is linked by a little ring with three methylenes to that amino acid. Again, this may seem, you know, sort of an unnecessary detail or something, but this is the way life evolved on Earth. This is an amino acid, but because of this ring structure, this bond is not able to uh, not able to rotate. So wherever a proline shows up in a sequence, it puts some structural constraints on the conformational space that that, uh, that that chain is capable of getting itself into. So when we study protein structure, uh, this is sort of at the heart of, of, of how proteins work. Uh, we'll spend quite a bit of time in the ensuing lectures talking about the, the central dogma and the idea that <clears throat> the uh, linear order of the amino acids uh, in a protein is determined by the sequence of the DNA and how that's encoded. But at the end, what you end up with is a linear sequence of amino acids all joined together by peptide bonds. And there's an incredible number of conformations possible these things could go all over the place in all kinds of different ways, yet only one form in general is the biologically active 
confirmation, or maybe there's a couple of them and it switches back and forth as part of a machine action or, a, or part of what it does. But by and large, for every protein, there'll be one or just a couple of, of confirmations. And so understanding proteins, uh, what many, many people are interested in is trying to understand how you can get from that linear sequence and determine the three-dimensional structure. There are techniques, uh, X-ray crystallography and NMR techniques now, which enable us to get the structures of solve the structures of proteins. In fact, there's the structures of tens of thousands of them are in a database called the protein database. And we're going to be talking about a little protein viewer that you'll be using that, in fact, once you've used it in your problem set, you can go open the structure of any protein whose structure has ever been, uh, has ever been solved if you, if you want to do it. But what we're not, we haven't yet figured out is a reliable way of saying here is a protein that consists of a particular chain of, of amino acids, I'm going to predict its three-dimensional shape. So we, we understand parts of it, but not, there's, there's parts we don't know. And I'm going to take you through the, the, part, the first part of understanding protein structure. Um, and be to, before we do that, I want to just sort of talk about the levels of, of protein structure and the, term, the terms that are used to describe these. When people talk about the primary structure of a protein, what they're talking about is the sequence of amino acids. And it's possible I will abbreviate those that as AA at some point without thinking about it. So just in case I do, <clears throat> that's a fairly commonly used abbreviation for amino acids. So that's simply phenylalanine joined to a proline, joined to a glycine, joined to two cysteines, joined to something else. Um, but that's not terribly uh, useful in terms of telling what the protein does. Uh, then there's secondary structure. These are regions of local folding, and they're driven by, guess what, hydrogen bonds. And we'll talk about how that goes in just a moment. Then the term tertiary structure is the term used to describe the entirety of the folded protein. If I went in and determined the structure of a of a protein using X-ray crystallography, this is what I would see. It'd be the tertiary structure. And there are other forces that we haven't discussed yet that contribute to, the, to that tertiary structure. And then a quaternary structure means that there's more than one polypeptide chain. And it could be as simple as an enzyme that's got two subunits, and you've got to have them both there in order for it to work. Or as I think you're beginning to probably get the sense from my use of the term protein machines, there are structures that have multiple interacting proteins and have complexities that rival some of the mechanical things that we build, our, that we build ourselves. So the uh, interesting story a little bit how um, the insights into uh, um, secondary structure were first uh, arrived. There was at, some of you may have heard uh, the term Linus Pauling. He was at Caltech, got a Nobel Prize winner, very, uh, very influential scientist in a variety of ways. Um, that the, the key insight that, uh, that Linus Pauling had came uh, in the late 1940s. Um, people had been doing x-ray crystallography on minerals and things like that. And the basic idea was you had a crystal of some type, you bounced the electrons off, you got a diffraction pattern, and then you could work backwards and figure out the structure that was generating the diffraction pattern. And that had then been extended 
to proteins when it was discovered there were certain proteins that would crystallize and you could bounce electrons off and get a diffraction pattern and at least a category of these proteins an analysis of the uh, of the diffraction pattern suggested it was some kind of helix and there was a repeating element of about of about 5.4 angstroms roughly and so Linus Pauling was very interested in protein structure and I think it was in late 1948 he was visiting um, he was visiting uh, England and he caught the flu just like <laughs> some of you have been catching and he spent a few days reading detective stories and then he got bored and so he tried to take on this think about this problem while he was lying in bed and he made a simplifying assumption he said let's just forget about the, uh, all the side chains. Maybe they don't really matter in terms of this basic property. Maybe it's determined by the backbone of the, um, of the peptide chain. So he took a little strip of paper, started pleating it, and he was a very good chemist. So he knew about this partial double blind character of the, uh, of the peptide bond and the constraints that it put on the structures that the protein uh, uh, could take. And in doing this, he realized that if he, if he sort of folded the thing into a helix, kind of like this, into a right-handed helix, that things worked out such that the carboxyl group in the backbone was just beautifully positioned to form hydrogen bond that was on one of the, the nitrogens. He called this an alpha helix. There were 3.7 amino acids per, per turn. And the distance from here to here is 5.4 uh, 5 angstroms. And if we just Sorry, I didn't, I meant to put that up earlier, or did I go backwards? There's, anyway, there are all the amino acids and they're in your book. Um, here is just the, the backbone of a, um, of, of an alpha helix and the, the sort of orangey yellow colored bonds are the hydrogen bonds and I hope you can sort of see how the spiral goes and you can also see as it goes by, you can look right down the, the hole down the middle of the helix. So let's put on some amino acids now. And again, you'll see as it goes by, you can look right down the helix, but do you see how all the amino acids stick out onto the side? And if you look, for example, there is a phenylalanine and a tyrosine. They're aromatic uh, groups that are very um, hydrophobic. And uh, up here is, uh, there's a lysine. So that's this side of the helix is charged. Uh, that's a glutamate, so there's a couple of charged amino acids on this side of the helix. Up here we've got a water, a water heating part, and somehow this is, I think, reminding me that I left something out. Let me just fix that up while I'm at it. The, the um, other hydrophobic amino acids, I forgot to say those, are is isoleucine, valine, methionine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Those are in your those are in your book. Those are other examples of hydrophobic amino acids. But I think even in this little example of a um, of, of an alpha helix, you can sort of see depending on which amino acid was where along that little region of, of alpha helix, it would very much influence what that part of the protein was capable of doing. There's a second region of uh, kind of secondary structure that's very important. It's called a, a beta sheet. The one I'm showing you is an example of an anti-parallel beta sheet, although you can have parallel beta sheets as well. But what I've done here is to take one strand of a polypeptide chain, and I've written it out this way, and then I've taken 
a second, um, what is happening? Oops. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. The, the stool just broke. OK. <laughs> Fortunately, I noticed. Um, so what we have uh, here is that the possibility for um, hydrogen bonding between this hydrogen of the amino group and this oxygen again. So we can get hydrogen bonds formed like this. And this makes what are called beta, a beta sheet structure. And they can build up as well. This next one gives you, you can see how you can sort of put one beta sheet on top uh, of another. And both of these are the two major types of, of secondary structure. And they, uh, the way um, an alpha helix is represented is something like this. This would be an alpha helix. And a beta sheet is, is written as a, uh, an arrow like that. And so most proteins uh, tend to have structures that consist of, for example, an alpha helix, some kind of turn, maybe a beta, excuse me, a beta sheet, another turn, another beta sheet. Now maybe a turn, maybe an alpha helix going this way. Some combination of regions of of secondary structure. And I've got uh, just a couple of, um, of examples of that. Um, here you can see a, dom a, a domain of a protein with the, some beta sheets in purple, uh, an alpha helix in, in green. Um, where that, that's a piece of a protein um, coming, coming from what's known as the, the uh, BRCA1 gene. Some of you may be aware there's a familial susceptibility to colon cancer, excuse me, to breast cancer um, that was discovered. It's a, it's a complex protein. Part of it, and very, very important part of it, is this piece known as the BRCT domain. It's the BRCA1C terminal domain. It consists of beta sheets, alpha helix. Here's a protein I've already shown you the structure of, but maybe you recognize now that green fluorescent protein is mostly beta sheets. See all these beta sheets these going down here. There's a little bit of an alpha helix up there. I think there's a bit of one over here. Um, here's an example of a protein that mostly alpha helix. What's this one do? This is a protein we'll talk about when we talk about DNA replication. It's involved in recognizing mismatches in DNA. For example, if a G improperly paired, got paired with a T during DNA replication, there's a system that comes along and repairs those mismatches, gives you another several hundred or thousand fold increase in fidelity. And if you mutate it in any, that kind of protein in a human, you have a familial susceptibility to colon cancer. So there doesn't matter uh, what their function is. When you get down to regions of secondary structure, you'll see these recurring things, alpha helices, beta sheets. And if you understand their properties, you begin to understand some of the basic structure of uh, forces that are giving the proteins their, their properties. That's an enzyme called chymotrypsin. What it does is an enzyme that catalyzes the, the cleavage of peptide bonds in other proteins. But there it is, got a lot of alpha helices, beta sheets, turns. You, know, you can go on and on. That, that one more, I just said one more um, up there. That's the RAS protein. That's an oncogene. You mutate that uh, in a particular way, you have a susceptibility to, to cancer. So it doesn't matter. All, when you get down to the protein structure, most proteins have uh, beta sheets, alpha helices. OK. Um, We'll go back to that one in a second. So we have to understand the, the, the rest of the structure of uh, proteins. We have to be able to talk about the other forces that are important for, for making uh, a protein. And the third force is pretty simple. That's an ionic bond. And it's just this simple, that if you had a polypeptide chain that had, for example, an aspartate with a negatively charged amino acid on it, amino acid and 
we had, say, a lysine, the four methylenes, and the NH3 plus that was attached somewhere else on that polypeptide chain. Then we could get an ionic bond because of the attraction between the negative charge in here and the positive charge on, on that. So that is one of the things that then uh, a force that can influence the structure of proteins. The next one is, is a hard one, harder one to understand. It's known as the van der Waals interaction. And here's basically what's going on is that a nonpolar bond can have a transient polarity. Sorry about this. Uh, and it can, do, it can in, induce polarity. in a nearby nonpolar bond, and that can then give an attraction. These things have to be, they need to be very close together, about 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 nanometers apart, the, the two nonpolar bonds, in order for this to happen. Does anybody remember the length of the covalent bond? About 0.15 to 0.2 nanometers. So within one or two covalent bonds, they have to be that, that close. Their strength is about one third, one quarter to one third to that of a hydrogen bond. And if you remember, the hydrogen bond is about 1 20th of the, um, of the force of the strength of a, of a hydrogen bond. But nevertheless, you can have a lot of them, because if you have an extended surface of a protein that's very close together, you can get a lot of these van der Waal interactions. And I'd always found this a somewhat esoteric kind of force. but. Uh, in fact, we're, we're familiar with these because that's how uh, a lizard manages to go up uh, a, a surface. It uses uh, van der Waals interactions. And as I'll show you in a minute, the trick is it's got little sort of hairs on the bottom of its feet that have a billion, about a billion split ends. And they're so tiny, they're able to make van der Waals interactions with the surface in a minute. You'll, I think there's a shot from kind of underneath. I got these uh, movies from Robert Full at Berkeley, who, who's worked on these. You can see them, the, the lizard kind of peeling its foot off. And here, they've made a little robot that can work by van der Waals forces. And it will climb up the wall, kind of like a lizard. And here's what's going on at a molecular level. These are the toe pads on a, on a lizard. On a, lizard like this. We're going to be um, just zooming in now. And you'll see they're covered with hairs. And if you keep zooming in more, there's more hairs. And we keep zooming in more, get down to a single hair. There's a 30,000-fold magnification. There's 115,000 magnification. And in the end, uh, a gecko, such as you've got here, has a billion 0 0.2 micron tips. And just to compare it to a human hair over on the, uh, over on the edge, then um, you can see what the gecko hair is like. It's in very, very fine hairs, and it's able to use van der Waal interactions to sink, stick to the surface. Bob actually made a Band-Aid by collecting these little hairs out of the, uh, uh, up the thing, and he made a little joke of uh, putting it out of a Band-Aid box, but this is an interesting thing because it isn't affected by water. You can peel it off, you can put it back down, and he thinks there were commercial possibilities for using these van der Waals interactions. So, okay, I think we have one more force to go, but I think we will uh, call it a, a day right here.